Welcome to this episode of ClearedCast, your source for security clearance, intelligence community, espionage, national security, and defense contracting updates, and our exclusive interviews with intelligence community and government leaders. Hello, hello, Clearance Jobs community, and happy Military Appreciation Month. I am your host, Katie, Editorial Communications Manager at Clearance Jobs, and you are tuning in to ClearCast, of course, and today I have Jill Hamilton, editor at the news site, joining us to give us a rundown on what's been happening in Clearance Jobs news during election week in the United States of America, and woo, what a week it has been. Am I right, Jilly? <laughs> It sure has. It feels like a really long week. Our secret squirrel, he had his own campaign even this week. Because mm-hmm. <laughs> squirrels around the world, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, we'll just dive right in. Let's let's talk about, we had some different intelligence news that posted. You looked actually at like, while things like elections were taken center stage, your piece, Katie, highlighted something interesting for the clearance holder, especially like if you're in D.C. or in Oregon. We wrote a while ago about there were more states legalizing marijuana with Election Day. And then your piece voted, like, talked about how D.C. was voting to legalize magic mushrooms. It's a good thing to highlight for us because it's important to note that while you may no longer need to worry about, you know, criminal record, because if it's legalized at the state level, the odds of you getting caught for that are are lower. It's still um, it remains illegal at the federal level, so it can still impact your clearance process. So it's something that clearance holders shouldn't ignore and should make sure they're paying very careful attention to. <laughs> so just because it's legalized on the state level doesn't mean federal laws have changed. Well, and with psilocybin, very, very interesting substance. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll be interested to see on the clearance jobs blog as it does you know, get decriminalized, especially since they're looking to utilize it within the medical community and, you mm-hmm. know, how, seeing what the effects are on folks who have depression or PTSD, even though they are administering it in sort of a clinical setting. Again, like you said, it's still going to be illegal at the federal level. I, I do believe for some time it's taken, it's still, you know, marijuana is still illegal at the federal level. I, I do not see psilocybin uh, getting, uh, <laughs> becoming legal in the near future at all. Right, right. And I think when something feels gray, like it's okay to reach out and check with an attorney or, you know, you do have resources. So it's good to have that, th- those resources to know that they're available. So mm-hmm. absolutely. And then, yeah. So we also looked about into, you know, Space Force is new. They keep, they keep finding different ways that, you know, you see how they're going to be shaping and creating this new service. And so I looked at how the National Security Space Association, they recently called for reforms in space security policy practices and governance, specifically with clearances. So they're pushing for establishing reciprocal access and security clearances between DOD and the intelligence community, which has long been a conversation, you know. So the paper that NSSA put out suggested that legislation or executive level agreements should be between the DOD and the IC, have those put in place to facilitate the joint use and co-use of facilities, SCI personnel access, secure networks, communications, and clearance adjudication decisions, which kind of piggybacks onto what they were talking about in the the INSA symposium earlier where leaders in the IC community were talking about like even like shared skip spaces, you know, even how COVID's changed all those things. It's something that perhaps even the trials of this year could bring about some good changes because they're basically warning that with the space community, like it is a, you know, it might favor like a larger company having access to doing the work because they have a larger overhead and they are able to go after the bigger contracts for that. So they're warning that, you know, if you keep out the smaller companies unintentionally without having them involved, we're going to miss out on new ideas, technology, capabilities, and different applications, which is a valid point. So just needs to, you need to be careful, obviously, with clearance reform and how you go about that, just not so quickly and haphazardly. <laughs> Sure. Two things in this piece that make me happy, you know, one, what you just spoke to, diversity across the board, whether that's your people or, you know, the size of companies, diversity with companies. I think that's important just to stay innovative, you know, in coming up with solutions. And second, anytime I see reciprocity for security clearances, I just love it. And I know that clearance Mm -hmm. holders love it because it just widens, you know, their job opportunities. If the 
reciprocity is there. And that segues really well (laughs) into talking about the security clearance world, because like, I think it often feels like a mystery, you know, like, why don't you have access into both DOD or IC? Why can't you move back and forth? I think it's really helpful when we have experts who've seen a lot in the field. I think when there's changes that are being made at the reform, like when things are being reformed and adjusted to better fit what our country's needs are and better address what our missions are. But then you also have attorneys or people who can help you like dispel rumors, know where you need to be more cautious, you know, like case in point marijuana, you know, like know what to do. So Sean Bigley, he explained a clearance term that clearance holders need to be aware of derivative classification. So at first glance, I was like, okay, what is that? But it's actually something I should have been aware of back <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> in my, my time on the job. I had no idea what it was. It's just like the deficiencies in training that don't really prepare clearance holders for this because it, it you would probably be surprised how much this is probably happening without people really realizing it. So every clearance holder needs to understand this concept, especially like if you're compiling quad charts, which lots of people are, or presentations from multiple sources within your organization, especially like if they're at different clearance levels. So if you've got a document that's a secret, another one that's top secret, and you're not pulling entire pieces of information. You might be paraphrasing it or you're just using an image. He goes over about exactly how you need to be cautious with that. So he gives examples. His second example I'll give, he says, you're tasked to review a series of secret charts and graphs and paraphrase the data for a PowerPoint presentation. Since you're not using the images themselves and only paraphrasing the data, can you create your PowerPoint on Nipper and send it over regular email? He says, no. Paraphrasing classified data results in paraphrase work product classified at the highest level of classified information it paraphrases. So the resulted document must be marked and handled accordingly until and unless determined otherwise by security officials. So just because you didn't lift exact words from the classified document, but you're talking about in general doesn't mean that you can automatically just put whatever classification on that document that you want. So I was really like, oh. Oh, that's, that's super critical. <laughs> it is. Well, and Jill, I, ha- I have a funny little anecdote for you on this one, because Uh-oh. it is something that all clearance holders really do need to be aware of. At first glance, I think a lot of clearance holders, when they saw this article, they're like, why the hell are they posting that? Everybody already knows that. Even one person commented, I'm not sure what really inspired this article, but classifying a derived product is a basic level task if you have a clearance. That is true. But like you said, the training is not there. And so Mm -hmm. when I supported contractors, I had a colleague who has been working in the intelligence community for some 30 years. He had a TSSCI, but he was not trained on derivative classification, clearly, because he was not classifying information at the correct level. Mm -hmm. And we ended up having to let him go over it because, you know, if you're working with classified information, you absolutely need to be aware of those things. So it's not really a funny anecdote. It's a very serious uh, topic. But uh, yeah, I think a lot of people were like, what inspired that article? But you would be surprised. A lot of people just don't know. Yeah, because I think quad charts are compiled on the regular. And so even just documents like that, or just, just to be understanding how you're handling like you you might think it's just an image, but it is something that you can easily overlook and not realize that you are not handling information as you signed up to do, you know? Mm-hmm. So it may seem basic, but uh, his scenarios definitely helped highlight exactly where you could go wrong. And then William Henderson had another one that helped explain a term that people may not be as familiar with. It's called written interrogatories. He explained that with interrogatories, you're verifying a portion of your subject interview. You need to take it seriously. And in order to make sure that it's not just like a precursor to a statement of reasons for you, you have to really pay attention to those answers. So he says, receiving interrogatories should be regarded just as seriously as receiving um, your statement of reasons. So if you do a good job responding to the interrogatories, it could result in receiving a clearance and significantly shortening the adjudicative process. Alternatively, it could provide DOA with additional evidence to strengthen the case against you, granting you a clearance. So basically, it could lead to d- denial if you don't take it seriously. So it was helpful because he established the difference between the statement of reasons and the interrogatories and how you can Like, just know the difference of what you're dealing with, but also to not be flippant with interrogatories when you're responding. Sure. Well, and within the different 
communities that grant clearances, there are those different semantics. So it is good to Mm -hmm. be aware of those. Yeah, super helpful. Yeah. And then uh, looking at career advice for the week, Steve Leonard, he looked at what I think is often an underappreciated component of leadership, which is morale. So I think we hear a lot of talk, see, it can feel a little bit fluffy at times talking about, you know, the value of company culture, but we often neglect to look at how uh, morale plays into that. So Leonard states, morale also underpins the culture of an organization. A team with high morale will exude a winning attitude, and that kind of confidence breeds success. Take that away, and as confidence breaks down, so does the culture. An organization with low morale will eventually slip into a culture that engenders negativity and an attitude that fosters failure. Bad things happen when morale drops. Mic drop. <laughs> um, which is so true. Because ta- And then he talks away about the ways that leaders kill morale. So it's funny because, you know, my former life as a school teacher, my sixth graders used to whine and complain when they're like, why do we all have to stay in for recess? Or why do we all have to do this extra thing when two people were the problem? And it starts at such a young age, you know, and my own children will complain about this as well. And I'm like, you know, you're actually right. You shouldn't actually um, have to pay the penalty for somebody else's failures, which happens, you know, like you see it even like in telework, you know, we, we say how we need to expand our use of telework. Well, Along the way, sometimes leaders have a bad view of telework because a few bad apples will have ruined their perception of how it can be. So they've made blanket statements or they approach it because of one person's negative behavior. So I think it's really important to have standards, to apply them equally across the board, which Steve goes into is one of his first two points. Leaders kill morale when they reward the wrong people or, you know, you punish the wrong people, punish everybody, or you reward people just because... They're not doing well, so you're trying to clean up the problem and maybe help them move along. But it really sends the wrong message to your entire team. And then if you don't enforce standards, that also can kill morale. And I think it's important because he, he talks a lot about like, you know, the narcissist um, narcissist who's like the toxic leader. And we spend a lot of time, we've all seen them. But this to me is, speaks a lot to maybe somebody who's as a leader, not really paying attention or understanding how critical their approach to building their team really is like they're they're doing their best they're not trying to be a bad leader but it can be happening without them really really realizing it so no matter where you are in the leadership chain i think it's important to understand this and how much damage you can do if you don't pay attention so he says he ends up with ultimately Morale is one of a leader's most important responsibilities, and it's the key to lasting success for any team. So wherever you're at in the team, wherever you have a leadership role, it's really important to understand your piece in the morale and like in building that and sustaining it. So I thought he had a lot of good stuff there. Yeah, a lot of good nuggets. And, you know, you make a great point about bad apples and, you know, especially with telework right now and COVID-19, just, you know, making sure that you're aware that not everyone is going to, you know, abuse the system. That's that's a great point, Jill. Right. Well, I think that's probably what's the, one of the benefits of what's happened with COVID is that since everybody had to go home, you could see how well the system could work despite the few bad apples. Right. You know, like, yeah. so it's not like you just had a few people testing out working from home. It had to work for everybody there for a while. So it's just interesting that, that that will I think that will help us get over the hurdle, especially with telework. But it does impact, you know, lots of other things when it comes to company organizational policy, things like that. So yeah, it's good to when, be aware of a- when COVID nineteen forces your hand, I suppose we just kind of have to go with it, right? <laughs> That's right. You got to take the silver linings where you can. <laughs> That's true. What can we look forward to on the new site this week? Yeah, it's another good week coming up. We of course have weekly recruiting articles with. Mine is on Monday, yours is on Friday with announcing, you know, who's hiring or any layoffs in the industry or what's like just different opportunities to watch for. And you have your different recruiting stories and obviously Halloween's over. So no more horror stories. We don't need to be frightened anymore. But there's a lot of focus on veterans this month and recruiting tips on that. So I think they'll be really great to hear their different stories, either veteran stories or recruiting stories with hiring veterans. I think that's really great. And then of course, we always have our clearance, leadership and workplace uh, knowledge bombs that we'll like to drop throughout the week. So Absolutely. keep your eyes peeled out for those. 
Yes. And if, if you are a recruiter or if you are a candidate, if you have a veteran hiring success story, we are running uh, a campaign right now. We're collecting those and I'm excited to see how those testimonials turn out. That is all we have time for today, but be sure to follow us and click that subscribe button on wherever you're listening to this episode of Cleared Cast. And you definitely won't want to miss next week when we sit down with an interesting influencer within the veteran community. So as always, if you have any thoughts or questions about security clearances or you want us to dive into a specific topic, you can send us a note at editor at clearancejobs.com. So happy Military Appreciation Month for everyone who's listening today from your friends at clearancejobs.com. And thanks for joining me today, Jill. Great to be here. See you guys.